What do you want? That is the question asked by the shadow agent, Mr. Morden, of all those he seeks to influence. And it's the question we'll examine on this episode of The Sci-Fi Show. going to be the first of a two-part episode examining the question, what do you want, and looking at it through the lens of the great 90s TV show Babylon 5, and the philosophical insights of the medieval philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas. I really enjoyed J. Michael Straczynski's series Babylon 5, the special effects look somewhat dated, but it generally had good storylines and the overarching series long tale was enjoyable. One of the major story arcs told of a millennia-long war between two ancient alien races. The only still active remnants of races known as the First Ones. Aliens that had first reached sentience and ruled the galaxy long ago, but had now faded into the pages of history and legend. The only two ancients that still had much to do with the younger races were the Vorlons and a race known as the Shadows. These two species had very different ideas of the way the galaxy should run, and this ongoing struggle, as they meddled with and fought alongside the younger races, had shaped the galaxy for centuries. Shadows and the Vorlons each had a question they would ask the different beings they sought to influence. The enigmatic Vorlons asked the question, who are you? And we'll look at that question later. This time I want to concentrate on the questions the Shadows agent Mr. Morden put to the different representatives of the major races on Babylon 5. The question Morden would ask over and over was, what do you want? He asked this question because he was in search of a being that could be bent to the Shadows' purposes. Morden could offer them the power of the mighty Shadow warships for their purposes, starships capable of immense destructive power, and at least early in the series, before the different species learned how to fight them, unstoppable. I've always been fascinated by Morden's question. What do you want? He asked it of different characters in the show before allying himself with Londo Malari of the Centauri, and acting as the power behind him. Londo wants to see his now-declining people restored to greatness in the universe. This ultimately ends badly for him. He eventually rises to the level of Centauri Emperor, but reigns over a blasted and destroyed Centauri Empire, and forever enslaved to the servants of the Shadows that are left behind after their masters are defeated. He got power and fame and glory, but it was a hollow gift in the end. His chief rival on the station was the ambassador for the Narn, Jakar. The Narn are a race systematically enslaved and exploited by the Centauri until the Narn threw off their oppressors in violent revolution. Initially, Jakar is tempted by Morden's offer and the ability to get revenge on the hated Centauri oppressors, but ultimately, all he wants is for his people to be safe and secure. This would be enough for him. Because Attaché Via, something of a comedy relief character, gives a very wise answer when confronted by Morden, asking only to live long enough to see Mr. Morden beheaded and his head stuck on a pike as a warning to others that some favours come at too high a price. It makes for a blackly comic scene later in the series, but a fitting end for the Medal of Morden. As I said, I've always found the question fascinating. What do you want? The medieval philosopher Thomas Aquinas tackled this question in his unfinished life's work, the Summa Theologicae. He asked the question, what does a man's happiness consist in? And he considers eight possible answers to it. Mr. Morden and his associates could offer power, fame and honours, and Thomas considers these possibilities among the eight. Aquinas had an interesting writing style. Each of the questions in the Summa consisted of the question, a collection of the best objections he could devise, and then answers to those objections. Thomas was a Catholic monk of the Dominican order, and he was quite an interesting character. Some interesting highlights from his life include being known as the dumb ox by his fellow students, chasing off a prostitute sent to tempt him from a monastic life with a brazier, and his insistence, as a rather portly man, to walk everywhere rather than burden a donkey or horse in carrying his bulk. A wise thinker who asked the question of a teacher when young, what is God, 
and then spent the rest of his life trying to answer the question. His life's work as the Summa was intended as a summary for beginners, and weighing in at around 4,000 pages, I guess the expectation was that we'd remain novices for some time. He took the best of the writings of the ancient pagans, most notably Aristotle, the text of the Bible, and the writings of earlier Christian philosophers like Augustine of Hippo and Boethius, and others, and synthesized them into a very complete philosophical picture of the world. Thomas's writing was very concise and to the point. He wasn't given to excessive verbiage, and this can sometimes make him a bit difficult to read. However, he did strive to be thorough, and he often provides excellent objections to the problems he faces before he goes on to answer them. He certainly doesn't shy away from the hard questions. Thomas agreed with the ancient philosophers that the answer to the question, what do you want, is simple. The answer is happiness. That's what all people want. But this leads to the obvious question, what does a person's happiness consist of? And Thomas tackled that question in question two of the first part of the second part of the Summa Theologicae. Thomas thought that there were eight possible answers to the question of what a person's happiness consists in. These were wealth, honours, fame, power, any bodily good, pleasure, a good of the soul, and finally, any created good. Thomas ordered these from what he thought was most foolish to wisest. Although, as you can guess by the last item, he thought it all failed. But we'll get to that. Note that all that Mr. Morden can offer, fame and power, are in the first half of the list. Consider the first two of these, wealth and honours, and we'll consider the remainder on the next episode. As is typical of Thomas's style, he first put forth the best objections to a proposition he can find. In this case, his objections are in favour of the idea that man's happiness consists in wealth, before Thomas goes on to demolish this idea. So how might man's happiness consist in wealth? The first observation is that if happiness is a man's proper end, then it must consist in the thing that he has the greatest affection for, and it would seem that money is a good candidate for this. He also goes on to note that a man's happiness consists in an aggregate of all the good things, and money can certainly buy a lot of those good things. His final argument in favour of the proposition is the observation that the lust for wealth is infinite, and the desire for perfect happiness never fails, so the two are obviously one and the same. Thomas then goes on to offer a rebuttal to these ideas. The largest problem with wealth and money as man's proper end is that money and wealth are means, not ends in themselves. You use money to buy the things that will make you happy. So, if it's a means to happiness, it cannot be the goal. More than that, at least natural wealth can be satiated and filled. There are only so many gourmet meals and palatial dwellings and fast cars a person can have before any more will become pointless, or even a negative. This isn't true of money, you can always want more of that, but this artificial wealth is still only a means to an end. Aquinas also goes on to refute each of the arguments he made in favour of the proposition that money is man's happiness. He rather bluntly calls the person who seeks money as happiness a fool, and he observes that the happiest people are rarely the richest, but the most content with what they have. More than that, not all good things can be had for money. There are many spiritual goods that no amount of money can purchase. Wisdom is not something that money can buy, and it's likely something that will be impaired by great wealth. Thomas concludes that wealth cannot be the source of happiness for a man. It seems like a failed good, and even if Morden could offer it, it's unlikely to make us truly happy. The ancient Israelite philosopher King Solomon observed the same thing in Ecclesiastes. Seeing that great wealth might be able to procure many pleasures and comforts, but they are, in the end, nothing more than an empty chasing after the wind. Perhaps Morden can offer us something. Thomas next considers the question of honours which is to be held in good regard by your fellow man. Morden, through the use of his shadow warships, does offer Londo the ability to be the man who restores the Centauri Republic. Surely this is an honourable and good goal. Surely happiness could consist in fulfilling this desire. Thomas doesn't think so. His arguments in favour of honour go as follows. Happiness is the reward of virtue, and according to Aristotle, virtue is rewarded by honour. Therefore happiness consists in honour. Additionally, happiness belongs to God and persons of great moral excellence. And Thomas cites the Apostle Paul in noting that honour belongs to God. Finally, Thomas observes that man desires happiness, and few things seem more desirable than honour. 
Men will suffer the loss of everything, even their lives, to preserve their honour or their family's honour. The last of these was at least true in Aquinas and Aristotle's day. I think as a civilization, we have lost some of that. I'm not sure that loss was a good thing. Now Thomas disagrees that man's good consists in being honoured. The basic problem is twofold. Firstly, a man is honoured because he has some virtue or excellence in himself. The honour is a consequence of this virtue and excellence. Thomas again quotes Aristotle, who observes that honour is a reward for virtue, but the point of being virtuous is not to be honoured. If anything, trying to be virtuous so that you will be honoured will corrupt the attempt and you will fail. You need to be virtuous for its own sake, and you may be honoured as a result, but it can't be the goal. This is similar to the observation about pleasure. You can't really pursue pleasure for its own sake. That is hollow. But you may derive pleasure from pursuing some other good. Pleasure like honour is a reward. But we'll get to pleasure later. Aquinas also notes that honour is due to God, and to excellent people. But this is attesting to what they already have. It's a recognition, not something that is added to what they already are. There's also an additional difficulty. If man's happiness consisted in honour, then a man could be happy with honour that was attributed to him falsely, to be honoured by others, even though he doesn't actually deserve such honour. I'm not sure anybody desires to be honoured in this way. To be honoured falsely, to be held up as courageous and strong when you know at heart you're a coward, and you did not earn the honour bestowed on you. Does anybody want to live like that? It seems that, far from making you happy, this would actually make you miserable. I think Thomas was mistaken about wealth and honour. We'll look at his other six possibilities on the next episode. Perhaps Mr. Morden can offer us something that might suffice. You can find more information on the different ideas contained in this episode in the show notes on scifishow.com. And if you missed Babylon 5 when it aired, you can find links to purchase it from Amazon in the show notes. The effects are a little dated, and the first season could be better, but the show is worth the watch. I can be reached with comments via feedback at scifishow.com, and you can leave a comment in the show notes on scifishow.com. And you can also leave comments on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash sci-fi show. You can also follow the show via The Sci-Fi Show on Twitter. If you do enjoy the show, please go over to our Facebook page and click like. If there's a topic you'd like me to look into, please don't hesitate to ask. And don't forget, it's Fi with a PH. Let me know what you think. Sci-Fi Show is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike 3.0 license and the music is by Furious J and Maniacal M. The Sci-Fi Show is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcast to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, interface Christianity with the world, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.